that, that, Lord Jesus, that you are seated upon your throne and the earth is your footstool. And that means that every circumstance and every situation that we go through is still under your feet. And we're thankful for the cross of Christ for the burial, for the death, for the resurrection, for the ascension of Christ, that you are seated at the right hand of the Father and that we are seated with you in heavenly places. So if it's under your feet, even though sometimes we might feel like a heel, it is still under our feet as well because we are head in Christ and God. And we thank you for that this morning, Father, that no matter what we've been going through, we have the in Christ, every situation, every circumstance I speak to that's contrary to the Word of God, contrary to the promise of God, contrary to the plan of God, and I command it to bow its knee in the name of Jesus. Every harassing, attacking voice of the enemy, I command you in the name of Jesus, shut up in Jesus' mighty name. You are the accuser of the brethren, and you are the father of lies. You don't know how to do anything but lie, and but we are the sheep of God's pasture. We hear his voice and the voice of another we will not acknowledge, we will not hear, we will not follow in the name of Jesus. Devil, you are a liar, and so, Father, we speak the word of God contrary to that lie of the enemy that says we are more than overcomers in Christ, that tells us that we are victors, that you are leading us forth in triumph always, that you have placed us above and never beneath, that you have put us ahead and never behind that you cause our portion and our cup to run over with the blessing of God. Be all around us, but you prepare a table of blessing before us in the face and in the presence of our enemies. So, Father, we thank you that the table is spread this morning in your presence and of your word. We're grateful this morning that you that we can run into the name of the Lord that is a strong tower and cry, safety. I made it to safety. Father, we thank you that we are out of reach of the enemy's touch, out of reach of the enemy's grasp. And we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise for it today in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Glory to God. No matter what you find yourself currently facing, we'll do communion at the end, no matter what you find yourself currently facing, God had a word already prepared for your life. God had a word already spoken for you to grab a hold of. God already had a word prepared for you, and it's found in his word. It's found in his word. past couple of weeks, we've looked at different points of Scripture. If I can find the right date, we'll be good. A couple of weeks ago, we ministered out of Titus chapter 3, verse 4 through 7. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And then we ministered from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 in the Amplified Version. It says, Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ the Messiah, he is a new creation, a new creature altogether. The old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and new has come. We ministered along the lines and reminded you that uh, contrary to what might be in hymnals for hundreds of years, uh, that we are 
nothing but sinners saved by grace, while that is a past tense, we were sinners saved by grace, let us turn our attention to the Word of God, which has been with us for thousands of years, that tells us that we are new creations in Christ. The old things have passed away. The old man has been crucified with Christ. We now live in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ that brings us a new kind of life. And how is that done? Not by keeping of rules and rituals, but through the regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration means to bring back to life. We read in Romans chapter 6 that we were dead in trespasses and sins. Our spiritual state before God, our connection with God was dead outside of Christ. We have no spiritual life outside of Christ. I remember when I first rededicated my life to the Lord and started going to church and started reading the Bible and started studying the Word of God and, and hearing the teaching of God's Word, it, it, the Lord showed it to me this way, that every single one of us has a spirit on the inside of us. We are made spirit, soul, and body. God touched down into this earth and molded and fashioned and formed us Uh, the first human, the first man out of the dirt. And so it is that earthly part of us that is in contact with this earthly physical universe. And we have five physical senses. And what we see and what we hear, what we taste, what we touch, is what we are in contact with in the physical, natural universe and realm and life that we live in. There is that soul aspect of us, which is our mind, our will, our emotions, our intellect, our desires in life. And that most of the time tells our bodies and communicates with our bodies and processes the information that our five physical senses come in contact with. We come in contact with something hot, either it's a, the first sip of coffee in the morning or a stove that we forgot was, was on, and that communi- our brain communicates with our bodies because of that physical sense that, oh, that's hot. The physical man touches it, senses that it's hot, but it's the, the computer, the soul on the inside, the intellect that says and communicates to your brain what course of action we're going to take, and that's done in a split second of pulling your hand away from the stove. There's the other aspect of us that when God uh, reached down into the clay and formed man, Scripture also records that not only did he reach down into the clay with his hand, but he bent down and breathed life into Adam. And so there comes that animation, there comes that life-giving force, there comes the Spirit of God rushing in and filling in uh, uh, the, the temple, if you will, of what God created in the earth. And so everything that is spiritual, everything that is supernatural, everything that is God is communicated to us by the realm of our spiritual senses. And so every single one of us has a spirit, but uh, uh, it's either dead or it's alive. Now, outside of Christ, it's dead because you can't, you can't receive life or have spiritual life if you are disconnected from the life source. You take, uh, you take something that you have plugged into the outlet that's running fine, and you unplug it, the life goes out of it. And so when sin entered the world in the fall, the the plug that was plugged into God, that was plugged into the life source, that was plugged into the spirit, was yanked out of the socket, the connection was broken, and the word of God came to pass when God said to Adam, if you eat this fruit, you will surely die. God wasn't necessarily talking about physically, although that came about in the eventuality of time, God was speaking spiritually, speaking. Now, when you become born again, it's not that God breathes in a spirit into you that you did not have before. God renews and regenerates by the Holy Ghost. That spiritual aspect and portion of who you are.
when I was a teenager, it, would, it was the Lord showed me, it was like every single one of us has a Bic lighter. And we carry around that Bic lighter. But then when we receive Christ, we get plugged into that life source then the life that was on the inside of that lighter gets lit. And now every single one of us is a, is a living uh, flame of fire, if you will, on the inside of us. So, are you lit this morning? Are you lit this morning in the Lord? Are you lit this morning in your spirit? Everything on the outside can look good. Everything on the outside can look prim and proper, and you can try to even uh, fake a smile, or fake a face, fake a personality, fake a happy, cheerful attitude, but really what's going on deep down on the inside. Jesus is all about getting deep down on the inside and bringing change from the inside out. That's what I want to talk about and continue to talk about this morning, 2 Corinthians 5, therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, the Messiah, he is a new creation, a new creature altogether. The old, previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. You get a new spiritual condition. You get a new slate before the Lord. You get a new living reality on the inside of you that will change what's on the outside of you. Because like I said, that even though Adam and Eve uh, fell in the garden and they were unplugged from the life source, spiritually speaking, everything about their life and everything about what they experienced in life began to dwindle and wane. You know, you can uh, tell somebody at one end of the spigot to turn the water off and you're 100 yards at the end of the hose and that and that water's been turned off at the source, but it's still coming out at the end of the hose. Well, this is what happened in the garden, that at the life source, at the, at the fount, at the origination of life, it was shut off. But you shall surely die. It was shut off at the fall, but it eventually played itself out when all the water ran out. 900 years later for Adam when he finally died physically. What happens to us on the inside and in our spirit will produce things in our life that will manifest on the outside of us. Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ the Messiah, he's a new creation, a new creature altogether. There is a difference between an eagle and a turkey. There's a difference between a thoroughbred horse and a jackass. Now, you take both of those creatures, both of those examples, they look very much the same on the outside. For the eagle and the turkey, they both have, they're both fowl. They're both birds. They both have beaks, they both have feathers, they both have wings, they both have feet. They're both of that species. You take the thoroughbred and you take the donkey. They look very much the same in some respects, but they're not the same. They're completely different creatures. Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ the Messiah. He is a new creature altogether. You might look the same like you did, but you're not the same on the inside. What tells a turkey that he's a turkey? What tells an eagle that he's an eagle? What tells a jackass that he's a jackass? What tells an eagle that he's an eagle? It's the DNA of what's on the inside. God in his word says that we have received the DNA of God on the inside of us in our spirit. And we are not the same being. We are not the same creature. We, as born again believers in Jesus Christ and followers of him, are something that this world has never seen before. 
new creature all together. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Not just some things, but all things. All things have become new. I want to ask you a question this morning. To whom are you yoked? To whom are you yoked? Who are you yoked to? Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That seems to be a contradiction. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. If it was light, why is it called a burden? Now, when we ask ourselves a question and when Jesus is talking about a yoke, we're not talking about that which you find in your breakfast before you scramble it up when you're making scrambled eggs. That's a different yoke. This yoke is a contraption of agriculture whereby a young ox will be placed next to an older ox and they will be yoked together by, by an apparatus of wood whereby one cannot go without the other. And so farmers use a yoke to train young oxen on what they're supposed to do, where they're supposed to go, how they're supposed to act. And so I have a question with that picture in mind. Who are you yoked to? Are you yoked to Christ? Are you yoked to Jesus? Are you going where he tells you to go? Are you doing what he tells you to do? Or is your yoke to something else? This is the thing about yokes that no matter, no matter what you want to do, no matter the stubbornness of the young oxen, no matter the, the hard-headedness of the, of the young oxen, it has to go where the older, stronger oxen tells it to go, to do what it tells it to do, how fast to go, how slow to go. And it's very important who you find yourself yoked to because where they go, you will go. What they do, you will do. And they will determine to you how long you stay there, how short you stay there. Who are you yoked to? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to remind you this morning, number one, that sin is burdensome. Sin is burdensome. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15 says, The way of the transgressor is hard. I don't know a single person who is lost, who is living a life of sin, that their life is not hard. You sometimes see the difference in families where you have some family members who are saved and, and following after the Lord and love the Lord, and then you have other family members that live a life of sin, separated from God, don't give a care, don't give a rip, just doing what they think is best according to the dictates of the master that they have for themselves called sin and called the devil. You can see the difference sometimes in the physical appearance. You can take two siblings, and the younger one is the one who has followed after the world and followed after sin, and the older one is the one who's loved the Lord and followed after the Lord. And yet, because of the hard life of sin, the younger one looks decades older and acts decades older than the older one. 
praising the Lord and being in the presence of that life-giving source brings beauty to your soul, and not even to your soul, but even to your physical appearance. You can tell a difference, not even just in the spirit, but physically you can tell a difference. The way of the transgressor is hard. I've never known a drug addict who had their life easy. I never knew an alcoholic that had their life easy. I never knew a person that lived a life of crime that their life was easy. It was always looking over the shoulder. Well, is this one going to get after me because I did this because of this? The way of the transgressor is hard. Isaiah 57, verse 20 and verse 21. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose water cast up mire and dirt. The water doesn't know how to do anything else but just go along in the sea. But the natural reaction and the course of its activity in life does nothing but kick up mire and kick up dirt. And so the life of a sinner doesn't know anything else but to kick up a bunch of junk and kick up a bunch of heartache and kick up a bunch of trouble. And they go from trouble to trouble to trouble to trouble. The scripture is true. There's no rest for the wicked. Isaiah 57, 21, there's no peace, said my God, to the wicked. Why? Because sin is a horrible taskmaster. It's been said, sin will make you go further than you want to go, stay longer than you want to stay, and pay a price too high that you never wanted to pay. Sin and the devil know no mercy. Sin and the devil are pictured in the life of Israel in the taskmasters of Egypt when they were in prison and they were in bondage to slavery and they did what they were trained to do. But even still, Pharaoh said, let's increase the burden. The burden of the sinner always increases. It never gets any lighter. Satan doesn't know how to go easy. Satan doesn't know how to calm down. Satan doesn't know how to back off. Scripture says that he goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is out for your throat. He is out for your life. He is out for your soul, and he knows no mercy. But that brings an encouragement to my heart that if he's out looking for those whom he can devour, then there are those that he can't devour. And I'm one of those that he can't devour. Can you say amen? He can't devour you if you're following after the Lord because you've switched masters. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. Either you'll love one and hate the other or you'll despise one and cling to the other. You can't serve two masters. Either Christ is Lord or he's not. What a joke when, the, when people say, well, I'm too good for hell, the devil didn't want me, and too bad for heaven, and God didn't want me, so here I'm still on the earth. What a, what a joke that is. Because let me tell you, your soul is so valuable and so precious that Satan, he's playing for keeps. He's after souls of men and women to do everything that he can to drag them away, and to keep them from Christ. And Jesus and God are playing for keeps. And he's done everything that he can do for you to have deliverance, for you to have peace, for your sins to be washed away, for that wall of separation that you've chosen to live behind to be removed out of the way for that burdensome of sin to be washed away, to be lifted up, to be carried away. Jesus has done everything 
at the cross, and after that, He sent the Holy Spirit to convict us, to draw us to the cross, for the Word of God says that if I be lifted up, then I will draw all men unto me. Christ was lifted up on the cross, and the grace of God, and the love of God, and the Spirit of God goes out to the souls that hear the gospel, and whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't matter what you've done, or where you've been. It doesn't matter who's kicked you out. It doesn't matter who's forsaken you or left you or done you wrong or mistreated you or mishandled you. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and you will find rest for your souls. He said, those that come to me in no wise will I cast out. Sin is burdensome. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. I'm all for preaching hell. I'm all for preaching fire and brimstone. I'm all for preaching conviction for sin. But we always must hold out that there is an answer in the cross. As, as hot as the flames are of hell, as real as hell is and the devil is themselves, all the more real is the power of the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of God to rescue you from where you are and bring you and take you to a place that you never thought that you could be washed and clean and pure and holy, not just looking good on the outside, but feeling squeaky clean on the inside. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know that, that when you present yourselves to someone... As slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, no matter what your bondage is, no matter what your hang-up is, no matter what your sin is, you don't have to stay that way. It doesn't have to be Lord over your life. It doesn't have to master you. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification or holiness or, or godliness. Sin will always take you further than you want to go. I remember those commercials from the 80s and the 90s, and you can find them on, on YouTube nowadays. And the, the final tagline of the commercial is, I never wanted to grow up to be a junkie. Everybody has high hopes and high dreams for their life. They want them, their lives to do well. But if you meddle and you play with sin, then sin will determine where you go. You think that just playing with a little fire on the side in the corner of the room, that things won't get out of hand. You can handle it because the flame is small. It might burn. It might sting just a little bit. But soon enough, the drapes catch flame, the carpet catch flames, and then your whole house of life is on fire. Nobody starts out a drug addict. Nobody starts out a serial killer. Nobody starts out. But it says, just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, sin only drags you deeper down. It never lifts you up. You might be looking for a quick fix. You might be looking for some steam release. You might be looking for an answer to a problem in your life. If I just cut corners this way, if I just lie about this, if I just... 
The problem with lying is you have to start telling so many lies, you have to remember what lie you told whom and how to keep which story perpetuating and kept on going. So then you're always looking over. Let me remind you, the way, the way of the transgressor is hard. And I want to encourage you this morning that the grace of God is more powerful than the grip of sin. These whole scriptures, the whole scripture of God from Genesis to Revelation points out the sinful nature of man that without Christ we're lost, we're headed, we're doomed for a devil's hell. It was not God's design or desire that humans go there, but because they've mastered up to Satan, because they've linked up with Satan, because they've not uh, gone to the cross of Christ to be released and forgiven from their sins and their bondages, then the punishment that their master receives is the same punishment that they receive. But even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even while we were doing our worst, even while we were in our darkest moments, those times that we like to forget ourselves, Jesus died for us. And that's speaking of his grace and his mercy, that while we were assaulting him, he was crying out for mercy, even those that were hanging him on the cross and crucifying him. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even while we were in bondage to sin, Jesus was speaking our freedom and our forgiveness. His grace There's that wonderful hymn. I'm reminded of the words, grace that is greater than all our sin, not just some of our sin, not just our, you know, not just the weakest sins, not just the lightest sins, but all of our sins. His grace is greater. His love for you. He wants to, Scripture says that love covers a multitude of sins. And I want to encourage those that are watching, those that are listening, whether you're here or whether you're there, Come to Jesus, whether it's your first time or it's another time. Come to Christ. Get free. He wants you to be free. He holds out the hope. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you looking for rest? You won't find it in the things of the world. You won't find it outside of Jesus He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He offers us, no matter where we find ourselves right now, he offers us a better alternative. Even when we think life is going good, even when we think life is going grand, even when we think that we've got life, if you will, by the throat, Jesus offers us even better. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The Young, weaker oxen is at the mercy of the older, stronger oxen. Who are you yoked to? Are you yoked to sin? Are you yoked to Satan? Or are you yoked to Jesus? The devil will have you go down a hard path. The devil will have you go down a dark path. Sin will have you go down a steep path path, the slippery path. Some call it the slippery slope of sin. You're just playing on the banks, but it's slippery, and all of a sudden, before you know it, it wasn't your intention, but out of nowhere, all of a sudden, you're down, gasping for air. Where are you, yo? Jesus. Because whoever you're yoked to, whatever direction they're going in, you're going in. So if you're yoked to Jesus, hey, he resides in heaven. You're going to heaven. If you're yoked to Jesus, then you're yoked 
to perfect love that casts out all fear. If you're yoked to Jesus, then you're yoked to peace, and you're yoked to joy. If you're yoked to Jesus, then, then you're yoked to a God who is more than enough, who can supply all your needs. If you're yoked to Jesus, you're yoked to someone who is a healer. He'll lead you in a path of healing. He'll lead you in a path of wholeness. He'll lead you in a path of light and of holiness and of truth. If I can steal it from Joel Osteen, he'll help you live your best life now. Being yoked to Jesus is not just about a better life after you die. It's about even a better life as you live now. Let me tell you, before I met Christ versus after I met Christ, I'm so thankful and I wish I had done it sooner because my life, let me tell you, I've never, not a day in my life regretted. Oh, I wish I could go back. Oh, I wish I could live like the world lives. I see how the world lives. I don't want it. I see what goes on in the world. Those that are without Christ. And I am thankful to the Lord. Is everything perfect in my life? No. But Jesus gives me power to overcome. And no matter what Monday, poor Mondays, Mondays always get a bad rap. No matter what Monday throws at me, no matter what Wednesday throws at me, no matter what comes my way, I know that with Jesus, he's heading a better way. He is the victor. He is the overcomer. And if I'm yoked with him, then that's where I'm going. Like we said last week, no matter the serpents that slither across the path, no matter the scorpions that that crawl across our way, as long as we're yoked with Jesus and he's leading us into victory, no matter what the devil throws at us, we will overcome and we will conquer and it will have no power and authority over our lives. Because Jesus is our master. Sin might be burdensome. The wages of sin is death. Sin will take a toll on your physical health. Take, sin will take a toll on your mental health. Sin will take a toll on your life. But Jesus says, you'll find rest for your soul. Souls without Christ are restless because they're looking for what will satisfy their soul. And they look to outward things. Substances, relationships, material things in this life, some achievement or some uh, 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 mental goalposts that they have. But outside the source of true peace, you'll never have it. Outside of the source of true rest, you'll never have it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me beside still waters. Is your life choppy or are you by still waters? And what I'm talking about is your life choppy, not necessarily outside circumstances, but how's your heart? Because you can have everything in life. You can have the best day that you've ever had, but you can still be miserable on the inside. It's like what it says here. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose water cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, said my God, to the wicked. You can have everything going for you, but you're still upset on the inside. You're still agitated on the inside. But Jesus says, come to me and you'll find rest. He'll he'll climb up on the bow of the boat of your heart and say, peace, be still. He'll give you peace on the inside. And he'll teach you to walk on the waves of the water because you are an overcomer in Christ. Sin is burdensome. Who are you yoked to? Who's your master? Who calls the shots in your life? And some people might say, well, I call the shots in my life. I can stop whenever I want. I'll do whatever I want. Let me remind you of pride 
is a sin, and Scripture said that pride goes before a fall. The greater the pride, the harder the fall. Scripture says there is none righteous, not one. But it matters who you're yoked to. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And can I, can, I, can I tell you this? It's not about a quick Sunday morning prayer, Jesus, forgive me, come into my life, and then you go out of the, of the doors or you walk away from that prayer, and then you live the same old life, you make the same old decisions, No, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You can't learn from something. You can't learn from somebody that's just hit and miss. I'm running into a crisis, so I need Jesus. No, you need Jesus even without your crisis. And maybe if you had Jesus, you wouldn't have come to your crisis. Learn from me. You can't learn from school if you don't go there every day. You might, be, uh, you might be enrolled in a community college course somewhere, but unless you're, you, unless you're keeping good attendance, you're not really learning everything that you could be learning. You might get a piece here and a piece there and a, and a date here and a piece of information that means nothing to anything else because you're not going consistently. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Christianity is not about a one-time decision for Christ. It's about a lifelong commitment of being yoked to him and learning from him. The young oxen doesn't get to choose when he takes off the yoke any old time he wants. The young oxen is yoked to the older oxen to learn, to gain strength. Sin is burdensome. And religion is burdensome. See, you can still have the appearance of godliness, but deny the power thereof. You can have, you can wear religious garments, you can wear You can have a religious attitude. You can have a religious spirit about you. But that doesn't mean that it's the same thing as being born again. You have a a lot of religious people that are going to end up in hell. Because it's not religion that saves. It's contact and a commitment with Jesus Christ that changes you on the inside where you are born again. Changes your desires, changes your dreams, changes your hopes, changes your life, changes how you live your life and make decisions for your life in your life. Religion is just about the outward appearances. Matthew 23, verse 1, Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you to do, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. Religion, you... You've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and you've got to perform this, and you've got to do this. You've got to do this ritual. You've got to observe and go through this rite. You've got to have the outward appearance of everything altogether, outward appearance of Jesus, outward appearance of being connected with God. But on the inside of your heart is a very different story. Jesus said that, that the burden of religion is a heavy bondage. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders. Religion will weigh you down with guilt 
and shame. I didn't perform right. I didn't do right. I wasn't this. I wasn't that. I didn't miss reading my Bible three days. You know, I missed reading my Bible three days in a row. I didn't read enough. I didn't pray long enough. I didn't do good enough. It's all tied into your performance instead of faith in what Christ has done. Religion is a heavy burden of do's and don'ts, rites and rituals. It looks good on the outside. Jesus told the Pharisees, you are whitewashed sepulchers. You look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're dead man's bones. And that reminds me of the scripture in Ezekiel where God says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? In Ezekiel, in chagrin, says, oh, Lord, you know. Only you can answer that question. And then the breath of God comes and life begins to come back into those old bones. Everything looks good on the outside. But how is it really on the inside? I want you to examine your heart. I want you to, I want you to think about, where, are you comfortable? Were you comfortable in the first part of this message saying, oh, yes, those sinners, they need Jesus. Oh, yes, you're comparing somebody else to yourself. That's a sign of the burden of religion. I, I outperform them, so I'm much, lar- much higher on God's totem pole. How quickly for, we forget that parable of the Pharisee and the publican, the sinner where the Pharisee was going on and on about, oh God, I do this, and oh God, I do that, and oh God, I do that, and thank God I'm not like that worthless sinner over there. Even people in the world have that attitude in their in their, uh, 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 trying to massage the guilt of not having Jesus in their life and living for the Lord. They'll say, well, at least I'm not as bad as that person. I might have slept around, but I didn't sleep around as much as they did. You know, I might have gotten into fights, but at least I'm like, not like him who killed his wife, and everybody knows it, but he didn't get caught. I'm better than. Once you begin to compare yourself and try to tally up your good marks, The weight of the burden of your sin and the burden of religion gets heavier upon you because it's not about how many times or as bad as or trying to be good enough because Scripture plainly tells us that it is not by men's works. It's not by the good things that we do that we receive salvation. It's not by the good things that we do that causes us to be good enough before God. It's about having a life-transforming experience. It's about taking the yoke of Jesus Christ upon our own lives and learning from Him, being in communion with Him, walking in step with Him. It's about being born again. It's about the one good thing that Jesus did on the cross that washes away the good, the bad, the ugly, equally and alike. Second Timothy 3, 5, they will act as if they were serving God, but what they will, but what they do will show that they've turned their backs on God's power. That's the translation or, or modern rendering, modern English rendering of They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. They look good on the outside, but they don't allow the Holy Spirit to renew and regenerate and change them from the inside. They they say all the right things. They can quote Scripture. They know what to do. They know how to blend in, but on the inside. But on the inside, they don't allow that Scripture to change their hearts. They don't allow... The, the presence of God in their life to transform them and to change them. They have an appearance of godliness, 
but they don't allow the Holy Spirit to do a deep work in their heart. Religion is burdensome. Religion keeps you on a treadmill of performance. You're busy, 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 but spiritually you're going nowhere. Ephesians 2.8, God's grace has saved you because of your faith in Christ. Your salvation doesn't come from anything you do. It's God's gift. It's not based on anything that you've done. No one can brag about earning it. It's not about being good enough. It's not about being holy enough. It's not about deserving it. Something bad comes your way. Well, I probably deserved it. No. If you're in Christ, you don't deserve any of it. It's an attack from the devil. If Jesus, if it's not in the list of Jesus' promises, then hit return to sender. You get a box delivered to your doorstep and you open that box and you realize nothing I ordered is in this box. This is completely different. You can return to sender. So when the enemy brings stuff and drops stuff off at your doorstep, if you open that box and you check your Amazon order compared to what's in that box, and now that don't, you, you compare God's word to what's in that box that just got dropped off at your doorstep on Monday morning, on Wednesday night, on Friday afternoon, on Sunday morning, how do the two compare? You can return to sender. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. Who are you yoked to? Jesus said you're yoked to somebody. Either you're yoked to me or you're yoked to something else. And if you're yoked to something else, you don't have to stay yoked to something else. You can get yoked up with me. And in fact, I want you to get yoked up with me because I want you to find rest. I want you to find healing. I want you to find deliverance. I want you to find peace for your soul. Religion will force itself upon you. Sin will force you to go down a road that you don't want to go down, that you had no intention going down, that you didn't foresee going down. But Jesus is the only one who just makes the offer, and it's up to you. It's up to you. It's up to you who you're yoked to. Jesus said you can stay yoked there, or you can be yoked with me. You could be yoked to a path that's headed to a devil's hell, or you can be yoked with me and enjoy eternal life starting now. In Jesus, you can only find rest for your soul. In Jesus, you can only find true peace. In Jesus, you can only find true love. In Jesus, you can only find that which your heart is longing for. Liberty, truth, and justice for all who come to the cross. Matthew chapter 12, but Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him, and he healed them all and warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold, my servant whom I've chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to those that are outside. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed, a battered reed, a battered reed, he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. And in his name, those who are on the outside will have hope. I will put my spirit upon him. And he will proclaim justice to those that are outside. A bruised reed, he won't break off. A smoldering wick. Jesus, Jesus is gentle and humble in heart. 
I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful to know that the true Jesus, not the Jesus that sin portrays, well, if you follow after Jesus, you won't be able to do this, and you can't do that, and you're not going to have any fun, and you're going to be miserable. No, you're already miserable in sin. The devil's a liar. The devil will tell you many lies and trick you in many ways to keep you from finding that peace and that rest. Jesus said, I'm gentle and humble in heart. Sin is a burdensome, uh, burdensome taskmaster. Religion is a heavy weight around the neck and around the shoulders. But in Jesus... When you come to him, he's not going to fight with you. He's not going to struggle with you. He's not going to cry out against you. He will receive you just.
to observe my ordinance. Why is his yoke easy? Why is his burden light? Because his spirit now lives on the inside of us. And what we try to do by religion in performance and what we try to do in religion by being good enough, Jesus now, because of spirit in our spirit, when our bicks get flicked, and the light comes on, the flame comes alive, our spirit is regenerated and washed and renewed by the power of the Holy Ghost because of the blood of Jesus, by the gospel of Christ, then he begins to live his life from the inside out. Instead of trying, religion works on the outside in, tries to reform, tries to change behaviors and thinking. But when you really know Jesus... He takes residence on the inside of you, changes your thinking from the inside, changes your heart and your desires from the inside. Those things that I used to want to do, I don't want to do anymore. That that way I used to think, I don't think that way anymore. Those desires, hopes, and dreams that were wrong, ungodly, unclean that I had before, I don't have those anymore. I'm changed from the outside. I mean, I'm changed from the inside. My outside gets changed because my inside has changed. That's why Jesus can say, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's because when we're yoked with him, we're like that young, weaker ox that's yoked to that older, strong ox. You know what happens when that weaker, young ox is yoked to that older, stronger ox, that when they live life and do life together and work together, guess who's pulling the weight? Guess who's doing the work? It's not the young, weaker ox. It's the stronger, older ox. This is how we have to see ourselves. Jesus changes us from the inside. When we're yoked to him, he pulls the weight. He's done the work. He causes things to come to pass. He causes things to work on the inside of us. He takes the burden and the weight and the yoke and the hard upon himself, and he makes it an easy job for us because he changes us. He renews us. He restores us. So my question to you this morning Whether you're here or whether you're there watching by way of live stream or replay, and if if you haven't yet, hit like and share so others can be blessed by this message. My question this morning is, who are you yoked to? Will you bow your heads? Who are you yoked to? Is there sin in your life? Has your life been unnecessarily hard because of the sinful choices and behaviors you've made? You wish things could have turned out differently. You wish you could have made a different choice in your life. While you can't change the past, you can change your present and thereby change your future. You don't have to keep going in the same direction. Broad is the way to destruction. Narrow is the way of life. You don't have to keep walking the same path. You don't have to keep going the same direction. You can change course. You can remove the yoke of sin and get yoked with Christ. Are you living in sin? In all honesty, in all truthfulness, in all sincerity, Has the heavy weight of religion been put upon your shoulders where there's an appearance of goodness, there's an appearance of godliness, there's an, an appearance of Christianity or religion, just a, just a thin veneer on the outside just to make it look good, but you know that there's a big difference of what, what the front you put on on the outside than what's really going on on the inside. This is why I believe that in in times of trouble, we've seen people walk away from the Lord. It's not because they lost faith in Christ. It's because they never really had a life-changing encounter with Jesus. All they had was the outward fixings of religion, the appearance of godliness, 
but they didn't experience that change that the Spirit of God brings on the inside. Maybe you're here this morning, maybe you're watching. Looks good on the outside, but you, you know the difference on the inside. You can take that heavy burden of religion off of your shoulders and realize that your standing before God is not based upon uh, denominational or religious or uh, 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 sect regulations or rules or expectations. That salvation is the free gift of God in Christ Jesus. Whether you're here this morning or whether you're watching, who are you yoked to? Are you yoked with Jesus? Are you walking with him? Are you doing life with him? Have you taken, taken his yoke upon your shoulders? Are you learning continually from him? Not just a one-off, not just a one-time, not just a hit and a miss, not just sometimes, but are you consistently seeking to learn from him, to pattern, to conform your life to him? He'll lead you, he'll guide you in paths of peace and of righteousness. As we said, the most famous Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me beside still waters. He cause, causes me to lay down in green pastures. Those are the places that Jesus wants to bring you. Those are the places that he brings those who will allow him to lead in their life. Do you have true peace on the inside? Or has sin kicked up so much ruckus in your life, there's no rest in you no matter what you do? Whether it's a first-time commitment or it's another commitment that you're making before the Lord and you want to be honest and you want to say, I need to change yokes. I need the yoke of sin off of my neck, and I need Jesus in my life. If, that, if that's you here, raise a hand up. If that's you online, send us a private message or put a comment in the comment section and just say, that's me. Jesus will change your life. Jesus will destroy the yoke of sin and bondage around your neck. It doesn't matter how long. You've been living that kind of life. It doesn't matter how long you've been making those kind of decisions and choices. Jesus can turn your life on a dime. You, can, you've been, you could have been gone down the same road for 20 years, but Jesus can give you a right turn in the right direction, and you'll be headed in a different, to a different destination. Let's pray together all. All together, once again, this is not about the outward words that we pray. It must come from a sincere heart. To get your heart right with the Lord, then you need to pray this with the right heart. Not just words of lips, but the cry of your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. Fill me with your spirit. Break the yoke of sin. Remove every heavy burden. Give me holy desires. Help me to live for you. And help me to learn from you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Still in an attitude of prayer, if you'll take your communion elements. This is what it's all about. This is the physical, this is the outward physical sign of the inward change that Jesus wants to bring about. And no matter where you are in your relationship with the Lord, no matter how long You've walked with him. No matter how long you have been learning of him and with him and by him, no matter how long you've sat under the tutelage of the Holy Spirit and learned from Scripture, let me encourage you, he wants you to go deeper. 
there's more to learn. If you think you've learned and know everything there is to know about God, your God's too small. I was once talking to a 90-some-year-old woman. She started coming to our Bible studies, and she said, you know, I thought I knew everything there was in the Bible, but since I've been coming to Bible study, I've, I've learned that, I, that there's a lot more than I can know. And no matter what knowledge you've gained over the years, the point is not to fill your head. The point is to transform your heart. So let that be a moment of introspection. Have you allowed the Word of God not just to fill your head, but have you allowed it to transform your heart? The job of the Holy Spirit is to conform you and help you to look more and more like Jesus every day. The longer you serve the Lord, the more you should be growing in Christ-likeness. People should see the reflection of Jesus in your life. Lord, we thank you that through the cross of Calvary, through the broken body, through the blood of Jesus, that even through those two symbolic elements physically that we take, it's symbolic of the spiritual reality of being yoked with you. And as we take broken body, as we receive your blood, we are identifying you as our Lord and as our Savior. It is not just outward elements, but it's a spiritual truth and reality in our lives. And they represent are identifying that without you, we are broken, we are a disaster, we are full of sin separated from God. And by reaching out and receiving what you did on the cross, we're receiving. We're identifying who we were, we're identifying who you are, and we're identifying who we can become by the power of the Holy Spirit. That what once was sin-filled and broken, that through the cross, by the power of the Spirit, you make us whole and you help us to be holy. Father, I pray that whatever is broken in our lives in the current moment, whatever is fractured in our minds, whatever is broken in our hearts, whatever, whatever uh, uh, jagged part of our soul that's there, whatever, whatever frailty or weakness of our physical being, Father, we pray that as we partake of the broken body of Christ, that your power and your life and your love and your healing would flood us, making those broken places whole, smoothing out those jagged edges, putting back together those shattered pieces. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Let's take and eat together. As we partake of the blood, we are signifying that it is only the blood of Jesus that can wash our sins away. We're so grateful this morning for the blood of Jesus. There's no altar big enough that we could build. There's no sacrifices great enough that we can offer to make a cover, to make a payment. For our sin. But you said that I'll lay my life down. The spotless Lamb of God upon the altar of the cross shed his blood on our behalf. Jesus, you said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And Father, we as believers surrender at the foot of the cross afresh and anew once again, and we thank you, Lord, that every stain and every shackle and every power of sin is broken, that you wash us white and clean, that you've done that, and that you are causing us to continue to walk 
in that way and to walk in those things that you've provided for us through your blood. We bless your holy name, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take and drink together. Father, we thank you for the mothers that are present with us today. We thank you for the mothers that are watching, whether it's biological children, whether it's adoptive children, whether it's, whether it's been those in their lives that they've seen as children, that, those that they've mothered. Father, those who have lost children, those who have had children taken away from them, those who desire to be mothers. Father, I pray in Jesus' name this morning to acknowledge that we recognize that it is by your grace you have equipped and enabled each mother to be an example of your love and your goodness. They may have felt ill-equipped. They may have felt like they didn't always do it right. But, Father, you see the intention of their heart. One mistake and maybe mistakes that have been peppered throughout Is nothing in comparison to the self-sacrificial love that mothers show to those around them, to those that are in their care. Let me encourage some mothers this morning. Things may not have gone always the way you'd hoped for. But you did. You did good. You were the example. You were the light. People make their own choices, their own decisions. That's not on you. Let me encourage you with the word of God this morning that says, train up a child in the way that they should go, and they will not soon depart from it. I pray that every son, every daughter, every person that has been in your care that you have mothered that are not walking with the Lord that from this day forward like never before that their their memory of Jesus and their experience of him in their lives will come flooding back that the songs that they once sung with joy will fill their ears and hearts once again. That the scriptures that they long to be in, the scriptures that you shared with them, the scriptures they heard in Sunday school, the scriptures they heard in church would make full circle and cross their paths once again. May their lives be filled with godly influence. And I declare by faith that every prodigal, every son, every daughter will come back home. If not physical location, spiritually home in Christ. Father, I pray that strained and hurt relationships with children will receive healing this morning. A bruised reed and a smoldering wick you will not put out. I pray healing upon those relationships in the name of Jesus. May children reach out to parents. May parents be received by children. May healing come to families. 
We thank you, Lord, for your love being poured out upon mothers today. We thank you for your grace with our women. We don't champion them enough. We don't appreciate them enough. But Father, today especially, we are grateful for them and honor them. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your presence today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. May they be blessed. May your presence continue to go with them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.